Thank you. Uh, the topic I have selected for today is uh, a prosperous tomorrow. The realization of uh, the right to development through Mahindra Chintana goals. Uh, during my uh, voluntary activities around Sri Lanka, I uh, and also uh, my work as a human rights trainer for uh, community leaders, the armed forces, and also public officials and people who want to become politicians, I came across this little woman in the rural southern coastal village of Talpe. Uh, I was conducting a constitutional literacy program on the constitution of Sri Lanka and during tea break she approached me and said, Madam, your presentation was excellent. You told me that I had fundamental rights but listen to my story and tell me how I can invoke them. Padma was a rural woman living in Talpe, as I told you. Her husband worked as a goldsmith until he suffered a nervous breakdown. After the family was sadly evicted from their ancestral property by her brother-in-law, that she explored, but it was the focus of much attention at the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights in, 19, in the 1990s. Among the major issues that were discussed by the conference at its preparatory stages was who are the most disadvantaged. Among those mentioned and proposed to be focused upon were the following. One, civilian victims of war, two, refugees and asylum seekers, three, rural poor and others living in extreme poverty, four, women and young girls, five, children including street children, six, victims of torture and disappearance, seven, victims of racism, eight, victims of human rights violations arising from colonial domination and foreign occupations, nine victims of terrorism. Clearly Padma's case falls into category three, that is rural poor and others living in extreme poverty, and category four, women and girls who are uh, considered a marginalized group. Can a practical solution be found by claiming relief through international human rights principles relating to the right to development and economic and social rights? Sadly, no. Economic and social rights are not guaranteed as fundamental rights in our constitution, as my friend Pasanta explained so eloquently. Economic and social rights are usually given stepmotherly treatment in constitutions. In the 1978 constitution, it appears in a very hazy way in the form of directive principles of state policy. These principles have set down for the guidance of parliament, the president, the cabinet of ministers in the enactment of laws and governance of Sri Lanka for the establishment of a just and free society. I get much inspiration from Justice Ambekar, the founding father of India, where he said, with regard to directives of principles of state policy contained in the Indian constitution, that the government may not have to answer for their breach in a court of law but we'll certainly have to answer for them before the election, at election time. The mechanism set up under International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is the United Nations Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. There is a machinery set up with 14 experts who sit in Geneva and who try to make economic and social rights a reality all over the world. 
but these mechanisms are out of reach of my friend Padma in Talbi. Although the NGOs from the Gaul area could send a letter or written statement to this committee about Padma's plight, the committee would study that letter or to give judicial recognition to uh, social and economic rights. Sadly, in Sri Lanka, the, the, with all due respect to the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, the Divinayaguma judgment delivered by the, our Supreme Court was extremely disappointing. The court failed to consider the right to development as a national issue. The judges looked at the bill when considering its constitutionality in a narrow and rigid manner without giving purposeful interpretation to this bill, which was to be promulgated in the larger national interest. The Divinaguma concept was targeted to develop the nation as a whole. The Supreme Court erred it by failing to look at the bill from the perspective of directives of state policy. The approach adopted by the Supreme Court, Supreme Court of Sri Lanka reflects the dangerous belief that directive principles are inferior to fundamental rights enshrined in Chapter 4 of the constitutional text. The Divinaguma bill was brought for the advancement of the Mahinda Chintana goals to facilitate the development of the Sri Lankan nation in the national interest and in the interest of the security of the state. May I have one more minute to conclude? Peace, development, and human rights are inextricably linked. They are interdependent. Respect for human rights paves the way for peace. A happy person, happy families, happy villagers would not want to go to war. Peaceful co coexistence is conducive for development. The concepts, therefore, peace, human rights, and development cannot be separated. They are indivisible. It was the duty of the Supreme Court to pave the way for the real realization of the right to development in post-conflict Sri Lanka. It interpreted uh, Article 154 in a very literal manner. The Supreme Court failed to realize 